The AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click Donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. And if you enjoy the show, please share it with your friends on Facebook and Twitter. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. This week, Janelle Jones of the Economic Policy Institute on how progressive Democrats are winning on the minimum wage. Author David K. Johnston on what's not getting covered in the way journalists cover Donald Trump. And Bill Press talks with Think Progress reporter Esther Lee for an update on Donald Trump's immigration policy and the lives left in limbo waiting for a resolution on DACA. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight, and follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Economic analyst Janelle Jones says a higher minimum wage is a crucial tool in bridging our nation's widening income inequality gap. And in the face of federal inaction, cities and states are stepping up to the plate. And we say hello to Janelle Jones, who is an economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute, where she works with EPI's program on race, ethnicity, and the economy, and the Economic Analysis and Research Network. She also worked as an economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Janelle Jones, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk to you about the minimum wage. Well, and we are glad to have you and, and, and looking forward to talking to you about just that. We've seen so much progress on minimum wage increases. It's kind of becoming hard to track, but fortunately for us, that's exactly what you do at the Economic <laughs> Policy Institute. So in regards to states taking action on the minimum wage, give us a picture of where we are at this moment. Right. So what we've seen um, over the last couple of years is because of inaction at the federal level, that states and cities have really taken it upon themselves to give their lowest paid workers an increase. And so 21 states and the District of Columbia have changed their minimum wage laws in the past few years. Um, And one of the reasons why I love working at EPI and all the data that we have is we have a very handy interactive map on our website that shows you the difference in minimum wage and tipped minimum wages across cities and states. Now, when you look at what has been accomplished at state levels, who's organizing these efforts and what strategies are they using? So the success of of recent minimum wage campaigns is really based on bringing in this multiracial, multigenerational coalition across cities and states. And I don't think that we can say enough about the Fight for 15 movement, which has just been amazing over the past couple of years of bringing people in who aren't usually involved in, you know, having a collective bargaining voice on the workplace and advocating for themselves. Um, It's really bringing in workers who usually aren't involved. So we've seen coalitions that involve low-wage workers, particularly in fast food and retail, um, who've really just band together and realized that collectively we might might actually be able to get some movement on this. So is it just about standing up and saying as a group, hey, look, we all need to be paid better? And it, I mean, it, it almost doesn't seem like that's enough. But it, so it's got to be more than just just a group of people coming up and saying, hey, wait a minute, we can't take this anymore. Or is it just that? So I think that that's basically the foundation of what we've seen. And when we get enough people kind of screaming at the top of their lungs about this, we see lawmakers and policymakers start to take it seriously. So we see people who are running for legislative seats at the at the state level, um, you know, advocate when they want to bring in workers, they want people, you know, knocking on doors for them. They know that this is an issue that really resonates with workers and with voters. So whenever it's put to a ballot initiative, it does really well. It's so popular with people from, you know, all across the political spectrum. Um, so really people running for office have to take this seriously. And I think that's because the coalition movement on the ground is really doing such a good job of kind of putting this in the face of people. So even if, if so, if you've got enough people, you're going to listen to your constituency, I guess, is the, is the bottom line there. Right, right. And you, all, you don't really have to all the time. But when you have something that is this popular across so many different groups of people, uh, you're, you're kind of left without a choice. 
Yeah. Now, even with this kind of progress, there's still a missing piece that hasn't changed since 2009, and that is the federal minimum wage. What exactly is the federal minimum wage and why is it so hard to change? Right. So the federal minimum wage was established in the 30s as part of the Fair Labor Standards Act. And it was basically to ensure that workers were paid a fair amount for the work that they did. And the current federal minimum wage is only at $7.25, and it has not been raised since 2009. And the tipped minimum wage is actually $2.13 and hasn't been changed since the early 90s. So what we've seen over the past couple of years is the value has just eroded because there has not been an increase. Um, And when we have seen, like, small increases, they haven't been enough to kind of offset this decline. Uh, And I think one of the reasons why it's so, so, so difficult to increase is because there's just so much pushback about what a federal minimum wage increase will do to businesses, particularly to small businesses, um, and to the economy as a whole. But historically, the federal minimum wage changed much more often if I'm not mistaken, correct, then then it has, I mean, all of a sudden it seems like it just stopped in 2009 and it was not going to budge, whereas before, every few years, it did change, right? No, you are absolutely correct. So up until like the late 60s, it was actually, not only was it changing, but it was actually keeping pace with productivity. So this is saying that as workers become better workers, they're producing more of the economy, the economy is growing, the federal minimum wage was actually moving along with that increase. And EPI has this very famous chart that shows you how those two things tracked so closely up until about 1968. And then there was kind of just a decision at the federal level to just let it fall, let the value of the minimum wage fall and not have it keep pace with productivity. Mm. Now, your analysis shows that 21 minimum wage workers in the 21 states stuck at 725 will be paid 31.7 percent less than workers in states with higher minimum wages. So who are these workers and what does that mean for their quality of life? Right. One of the reasons why I just really love this map is because you can just visually see the representation of where these workers are who are stuck in the incredibly, incredibly low wages. Um, so when you look at the map, one of the things that jumps out to you automatically is that it is a lot of this is concentrated in the U.S. South um, for a lot of historical reasons. There's also um, in right to work stakes, it's very hard where, where workers are not able to collectively bargain. It's hard to get higher wages. Um, And a great paper by my colleague, Dave Cooper, from last year shows exactly who would benefit from an increase in the minimum wage. And he has breakdowns by race and gender and family structure. And so we know that minimum wage workers are not teenagers. They're more likely to be women. Um, Workers of color are overrepresented. And then, like I said before, certain industries, particularly retail and fast food, employ a lot of these workers. And so economic insecurity, you know, is not just about a lack of stability or being able to prepare for economic emergencies, but it also has very real impacts on your mental and physical state. And this kind of spreads out to your entire household, your family, and into communities. Yeah, I mean, if you're concerned that you can't buy a gallon of milk and bring it home to your kids, that's going to weigh on you pretty heavily. It definitely weighs on you. It weighs on your partner. It weighs on your children. It weighs on how effective you can be at work. Um, it weighs on, you know, how much time you have to go to a blood drive or how much time you have to donate to senior citizens. I mean, it has just so many different, I mean, it just the ripple effects of low wages. It's really, it's, it's hard to overstate. Mm. We're speaking with Janelle Jones, economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute, where she works with EPI's program on race, ethnicity and the economy and the Economic Analysis and Research Network. Janelle, even for workers who have seen an increase in minimum wage, your analysis says the average wage is eight ninety an hour. That still suggests a difficult time making ends meet. So what do you think would be a truly fair minimum wage? And is there really a chance that we could get there? Yeah, those are two uh, very distinct questions, which unfortunately are not closely linked. So the first one on what is like a true fair minimum wage. Last year, some senators introduced the Raise the Wage Act of 2017. And so this is something that EPI very much supports and ran a lot of numbers for, and it will increase the federal minimum wage 
to $15 by 2024. And we think that this is a good proposal. We think this is great. And even if that number of $15 is a little bit scary, what we know for sure is that it can be higher than what it is now at $7.25. Like we know that it can keep pace with productivity. And if it had, it would actually be about $19 an hour. Now we're not advocating that, but you know, reasonable stepwise increases to $12, $13, $14, $15 an hour, these are things that our economy can withstand and that low wage workers deserve. On the question of whether or not we will get there, I mean, that's, I think what we've seen over the past year is our current administration is not really in the business of making the lives of low wage workers better. Um, so I think, I mean, it hasn't increased since 2009. We don't have a particular political environment that is friendly to workers and to increase in wages. So I don't think we have a chance. But what I think is hopeful and optimistic and exciting is that states and cities are seeing this and saying, this is this is ridiculous. We're not going to keep doing this. We're going to increase the wages of our low wage workers ourselves because we know that the federal government is not going to step in on this issue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from everything that I've heard and, and, and read, uh, those states that have taken the initiative and have raised their, their minimum wage, the results have been positive thus far. They really have. And this is something that we say all of the time is that when you give low-wage workers more money in their paychecks, they're not saving it, which is something that wealthy, pe wealthy people do. They're not, they're not squirreling it away. They're using it to buy their kids' school supplies. They're using it to maybe get maintenance done on their car. They're using it to maybe go out to eat once a week. You know, low-wage workers, when they see an increase, no matter how small, that circles right back into the local economy immediately. Mm -hmm. Now, looking ahead, what states will be taking this on in the near future? So we've seen a lot of action in a couple of states that have campaigns coming in 2018. The uh, campaign in Massachusetts that wants to fold in paid leave with a $15 minimum wage is definitely off the ground and moving. Um, after we saw an increase in Montgomery County, Maryland last year, we can definitely expect a campaign that will tackle a statewide increase sometime in the coming months. Um, we also saw, you know, shockingly, the minimum wage actually went down in some states in Missouri after it was preempted at the state level. So there definitely is going to be a campaign to get that on the ballot in 2018 um, so that they can they can see those increases that they actually saw for a few weeks last year, uh, but were then taken away. And I think as more states increase, you know, once your region has a higher minimum wage of $10, $11 an hour, it's not really going to make economic sense for you to be the one place that pays 725. So as we see states increase, we're, we might be able to see people being kind of peer pressured into giving workers the raise they deserve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Janelle Jones, economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org, talking at minimum wage. Janelle, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time and look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thanks so much for having me. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And we say hello to Janelle Jones, economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute, where she works with the EPI's program on race, ethnicity, and the economy, and the Economics Analysis and Research Network. She also has worked as an economist at the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Janelle Jones, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, and it's our pleasure to have you with us. You know, President Trump recently tweeted about historic lows in unemployment for African-Americans and Hispanics. And of course, he congratulated himself. We want to <laughs> kind of unpack this picture in terms of what's true, what's not true, and what's missing. So to begin, is there some real good news here? So shockingly, he is right. There actually is some good news. So a falling black unemployment rate is a positive thing. And what we've seen over the past couple of years is that as the economy has kind of been trending towards full employment, um, which means that the, the national unemployment rate is falling, employers are really expanding their hiring networks. And when they do this, they tend to bring in more racial minorities who have been left out of uh, the labor market. So low unemployment kind of pulls these historically disadvantaged groups in from off the sidelines, brings them back into the labor market. And this is what we're seeing in the black unemployment or unemployment rate. Um, and it's one reason why the Federal Reserve kind of held off on interest rates. So we know that 
we wanted to keep interest rates low, keep the economy growing, and we know that that's good for black workers, and that's basically what we've seen over the past couple of years. Now, in terms of what's missing, the president isn't tweeting about how black and Hispanic unemployment compares to white unemployment. You track this story very closely. What do we need to know? So I think the context for this is that historically, since this measure has been tracked, the black-white unemployment ratio has been about two to one. So black unemployment rates have been about twice as high as white unemployment rates. And that is still very much true. It's narrowed very slightly to about 1.85, but that's not great. And I don't think if like the white male unemployment rate was nearly 7%, we would be celebrating. So I'm not sure we get to set a very low bar for economic success for black workers and then applaud ourselves when we actually reach it. Um, So in in part because we know that these differences in unemployment rates, a large part is driven by just plain racial discrimination. Um, So there's still this huge gap between white and black work unemployment rates. And that's something that we really have to keep in mind, even as the black unemployment rate falls. Now, and of course, as you know, this isn't just an employment gap. It's also a wage gap. Can you explain that for us? Sure. So a really, really important paper by my colleague Valerie Wilson from last year shows that the racial wage gap between black and white workers has actually been growing since 2000. And this is, I mean, this is crazy and sad, but it's also like a really important point to keep in context. So sure, we're bringing in black workers, they're getting jobs, but what are their wages? What are their benefits? What are the qualities of these jobs? Because if you bring black workers in and you basically have them overrepresented among low-wage workers, I'm not sure how great a success that really is. And something else that we see um, in this report is that this, this gap in wages holds for all sorts of breakdowns by family structure, by education. So you'll have, you know, white and black people who both have college degrees and without a doubt, on average, black people are going to earn less. We're speaking with Janelle Jones, an economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute here on AmericasDemocrats.org. Janelle, you co-wrote an article last July with this stunning headline. Black women have to work seven months into 2017 to be paid the same as white men in 2016. That kind of leaves your head shaking. So what are the (laughs) obstacles that black women face in the job market? Right. So this this paper that you're referring to, we wrote for Black Women's Equal Pay Day. And yeah, what you said is right. Black women basically have to work seven months into 2017 to be paid what a white man was in 2016. Um, and the obstacles for black women are something, you know, that I think that we know, but that we really have to keep calling out because the obstacles are not being overcome. So one is like this intersection of racial discrimination and gender dis- discrimination hits women of color particularly hard. And we see this because black women are paid 67 cents on the dollar relative to white men, even after you control for education, years of experience and location. Your work also corrects some of the myths that persist about African-American and Hispanic unemployment. One of those myths is that white workers simply work harder than black workers. Please, what is wrong with that statement? Oh, just saying it hurts, just hearing someone say it actually hurts because it is so unbelievably untrue. And some work I'm doing with a colleague, Valerie Wilson, on the work hours for African-American workers shows that this is unbelievably false. Since 1979, the largest increase in annual work hours has been low-wage African-Americans. So these are people whose wages are not even that great, and they are spending an enormous amount of time at work. And when you take people who are in the labor market, when you look at black, when you look at blacks and whites, they actually work very similar hours. The problem is getting people into the labor market. The problem is the obstacles that are keeping people disconnected from working. But once they're able to get a job and work, they actually work very similar hours. And we see this enormous increase for women, for black women and for white women. Uh, but black women have always worked more than white women, and that continues to be true and has historically been true. Mm. And here's another myth. It says that if blacks just got more education, they could close the wage gap. Again, what's wrong with that statement? I mean, I don't I I probably say once or twice a day that education does not offset the effects of racial discrimination. 
And we see this everywhere. We see this all over the labor market. So we know that educational attainment for black workers, especially black women, has grown significantly over the past couple of decades. But we still see discrepancies in those returns to education in terms of wages and unemployment. So at every level of education, the black unemployment rate is higher for blacks than for whites. And at every level of education, blacks earn less than whites. So we really can't, you know, use education to solve the problems of racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. In tweeting about African-American and Hispanic unemployment, the president also said, quote, Dems did nothing for you, but get your vote, close quote. Is he right about that? I mean, I think it's going to be very shocking for me to say, but no, of course not. Is there more work that can be done for black workers, particularly low-wage black workers, by both Republican and Democratic administrations? Of course. But I can't imagine that the kind of attacks on workers we have seen over the past year in terms of the tax bill, health care, wage stagnation, the amount of like really terrible labor policy that is coming out of the NLRB, I can't imagine any of that being pushed through a Democratic administration. So, yeah, I mean, there's definitely room on both sides. But what we've seen, particularly with the black unemployment rate, that is because of sound economic policy that was decided long before Trump got into office. So the economy was well on its way to full employment and it has stayed that course. Um, and this, is, this was happening before January of 2016. So I think, you know, in part, I mean, a large part, most of what we owe this low unemployment rate to is to the democratic economic policies of the past eight years. Mm -hmm. Now, before we let you go, if a president really wanted to take on employment and wage disparities, what kind of policies would we be seeing? Yeah, this is a good question and something that we get all the time. I mean, I think in terms of like big, large scale dreams, I mean, the thing that's really going to solve this is seriously tackling racial and gender discrimination. And we do have, I mean, we do have a Department of Labor. There's a way that you can kind of enforce discrimination and make sure people pay when they, when they do it. We haven't seen that be the case with the current Department of Labor, uh, so I'm not sure how likely that would be. Another policy that we push here at EPI all the time is full employment. And I think, you know, what we're seeing are really the outcomes of full employment. The reason why we're seeing such low unemployment rates for blacks is because we are really pushing to get to full employment for the full economy. Um, another thing that comes up all of the time is giving workers the right to collectively bargain. Um, so unions are amazing for workers, but particularly for black workers. We see that they earn more, they have more benefits, their work-life balance is better. Um, there's all sorts of um, work benefits for workers who are in unions. Um, another thing that comes up is pay transparency. So when you don't have like, you know, these cloak and dagger back rooms where pay is negotiated, we see actually much more equality across gender and across race. Um, and in terms of wages, another thing that we can always do is to increase the minimum wage. This really brings up the wages of so many workers at the bottom and gives them a better standard of living. And they turn around and spend those increases in their in, in their paychecks. I mean, there's the other thing. So and it's, they, it's they spend it right away. So it really is a form of stimulus because they're really not going to hang on to it. They spend it right back in the economy. Sure. All right. Janelle Jones, economic analyst at the Economic Policy Institute, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Janelle, thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate it and look forward to having you back again soon. Thanks so much for having me. This is great. You're quite welcome. Thank you. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs> We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for Democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. Security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care.
This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security, and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing, or one time, in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America. Whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Author David K. Johnston says Donald Trump is a master manipulator of the media, and too many journalists have let it happen. We'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. There's a robot in your future, but not one of those cute little labor-saving automatons like a Roomba vacuum cleaner. Far from saving you from doing extra labor... This new wave of robots is being brought into your workplace to rescue corporate bosses from paying you to work for them. Oh, you might think, not my workplace, for I'm not a factory worker. I've got a college degree and I work with my brain. So no contraption doing rote mechanical tasks can take my job. But wait, these are thinking machines implanted with complex neural networks and super-fast algorithmic computers that operate in sync, functioning much like the cluster of specialized cells in the human brain. These brainy bots have a fast-evolving ability to watch, listen, and learn on their own, even able to produce and teach other robots. Not only are they displacing flesh and blood workers on factory assembly lines, but millions of them are now being moved into professional, managerial, creative, and other occupations previously assumed to be the secure domains of higher educated, higher paid people. Maybe even you. To be clear, it's not robots that are taking our jobs, but corporate profiteers. They're creating a robot economy in order to displace you and me with inexpensive machines that don't demand higher wages or health care, don't take sick days or vacations, and don't organize unions, file lawsuits, or vote for pro-worker politicians. It's to be a plutocratic utopia designed by and for the corporate elite, and they're pushing it hard and fast, hoping we the people don't wake up until it's too late. This is Jim Hightower saying, robots are not our enemy. The corporate bosses, bankers, and BSers who own robots are the ones doing this to us. And now is the time for all of us, whom they're about to discard, to rebel against their socially destructive greed. Hightower's commentaries are brought to you by the Hightower Lowdown, the monthly newsletter with Hightower's take on what Wall Street and Washington are up to. For information, visit HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. David K. Johnston is an award-winning journalist who says that a vibrant press is needed now more than ever. But journalists who focus on Russian conspiracies and Donald Trump's tweets are missing the point. And we say hello to David K. Johnston, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist who's been covering Donald Trump for nearly three decades. He's also the author of numerous books, including The Making of Donald J. Trump, and his latest book is titled It's Even Worse Than You Think, What the Trump Administration is Doing to America. David K. Johnston, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Glad to be here, Jim. And great to have you with us as well. You know, as someone who's been covering Trump for so long, you are in a unique position to assess journalism at large and and how it's been covering the White House. You've been a critic in the past about how the press handles Trump. Do you see improvements now? Well, during the campaign, there was a complete failure to scrub Donald Trump. That's the newsroom phrase for, you know, checking out a candidate back to day one. Donald Trump's ties to organized crime, uh, his involvement with this international drug trafficker, Joe Wexelbaum, got either passing mention or no coverage whatsoever. So there was a terrible job done in the campaign of telling people who Donald Trump is and about his lifelong career criminal activities that are thoroughly well documented in the public record. Now, 
once he took office, there was a change. Suddenly, they woke up in the newsrooms at the New York Times, the Washington Post, the AP, Bloomberg, Politico, and to some extent, the Wall Street Journal. And we've had really good coverage. The problem is most of that coverage has been connected to either the Russians or Donald's bizarre and increasingly erratic behavior, which I had predicted. What's not being covered is how the Trump administration is affecting you. We're not seeing stories explaining that your life has been put in jeopardy by changes in rules or failure to enforce them, how worker safety is in jeopardy, how uh, Trump has taken actions that are going to discourage job creation in this country and are helping China expand its economy and its political influence at the expense of the United States, about environmental rules that are not being enforced and unsafe practices. Uh, in environmental areas and public health areas. That's gotten very little coverage. So I set out in writing, it's even worse than you think, to explain to people, this is how your life, this is how your economics, this is how your children and grandchildren are being affected by what Trump's doing so that people understand that this isn't just fun and games. This isn't the Donald Trump reality show. This is serious business, and he is doing majorly damage to the United States and is a clear and present danger to the whole world. Now, the appearance of objectivity is a goal for many journalists, of course. How does this play out in covering the Trump administration? Well, there's a real problem with that because Donald Trump doesn't fit the norms of how you cover people. You know, all presidents and politicians say things that uh, may not be true, or they may be oriented to make them look better than they deserve. Donald Trump lies all the time, and he makes things up. Donald Trump creates his own reality. And journalists are having a hard time dealing with, how do, what do we do with a president who just makes stuff up? You can't call it a lie unless you can prove he said something previously that totally contradicts that. And even then, you have to give him the opportunity to correct. And so there's been a real challenge here in how to cover Trump. I believe the way to cover Trump is to police everything he says. So when he claimed that after his 55-minute live meeting with the cabinet, or as he put it, the studio with his performance, because what we're really seeing is the end of the first season of Donald Trump, the presidential reality show, uh, he claimed that uh, news anchors had written him letters praising his performance. Everybody thought his performance was fantastic. Well, I believe that the correct response to that is that news organizations should go to every news anchor in this country and say, did you write a letter? They should go to the Sandra, uh, to Sarah Huckabee Sanders and say, we want to see the letters. Um, she hasn't produced any letters. Instead, she's produced a list of uh, uh, television personalities who said nice things about Trump. But that's not what Trump said. Trump was very specific. And I think when he makes statements like this, they need to be run into the ground to show their nonsense. Enemy of the people is the way Donald Trump describes the media. What's the damage of this kind of portrayal coming from our highest office? Well, unfortunately, there are a lot of people in America who think the press is an enemy. I mean, I have given talks where I've had people tell me, you know, you want to impose Sharia law in America and you hate America. Uh, we, we have had a 40-year well-funded assault on the press in this country. And Donald has spent much of his adult life planting fake news stories, which I wrote about in my previous book, The Making of Donald Trump, like, you know, getting national news coverage that he was having affairs with Madonna, Kim Basinger, and Carla Bruni, two of the first two of whom he'd never met, and the third one of whom called him a lunatic. Uh, now, why that was news at all is beyond me, but Donald plants stories with journalists who don't care about facts, places like the New York Post, uh, owned by Rupert Murdoch. And when journalists do their job, they check the facts and they cross-check the facts. To Donald, that's fake news, because Donald creates his own reality. When he doesn't know something and he just makes it up, you are supposed to accept that that's true. When he says something and someone points out, gee, you said the opposite uh, earlier, uh, and he says, no, I didn't. When he says, that is my voice in the Billy Bush tape about sexually assaulting women, and then months later he says, I don't think that was my voice at all. I think that was all fake. 
he is displaying his contempt because Donald believes in his own mind that he is the greatest person among us. He has said this, that he is genetically superior to the rest of us. And so, of course, he should be president. I mean, Jim, how could you question that, of course, Donald Trump not only should be president, we should put him in charge of the whole world. He's the very smart. He has the world's greatest memory. He knows more about 20 subjects than anybody else. He is so smart. He can learn everything you need to know about nuclear missiles in 90 minutes. How dare you question what he's doing? So Mm. calling reporters enemies of the people is simply a way of trying to divert attention from the fact that it's a con. It's just a con job. He's a confidence man. And he doesn't want anybody to look at who's behind the curtain in the wizard's palace. Mm-hmm. And I, I still can't get over the fact that he thinks our libel laws need to change because you shouldn't be allowed to just lie. I mean, really? You mean like when Donald Trump, uh, like when Donald Trump was telling us that uh, Barack Obama uh, was not born in America and that he had investigators in, in Honolulu, and it's amazing what they're turning up. It's absolutely amazing what they're turning up. Never saw what they turned up, did you? Because they no. don't exist. Just lies right. and mix up. Donald has been lying and making it up for forever. And one of the things to understand about this is Donald doesn't read. He reads headlines. I've had Donald call me up and yell at me. And in one case, I remember saying to him, you know, Donald, if my story said that, I'd be as upset as you are. And he went, what? And I said, if my story said what you think it said, I'd be as upset as you are. Well, the headline says, and of course, that's all he does. He reads headlines. Hmm. We're speaking with David K. Johnston, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He's been covering Donald Trump Trump for nearly three decades, author of numerous books, including his newest, which is called It's Even Worse Than You Think, What the Trump Administration is Doing to America. So you brought up the fact that that he has attacked you. He's attacked a lot of individual journalists. A reporter who nobody ever heard of, I believe, is how he described you in a tweet. What are the real consequences of this kind of behavior on journalists? I mean, do you fear like a chilling effect on the profession? Um, No, in that case, I don't. Um, uh, the, the, The concern is about his threats to the owners of organizations. If you're the owner of a TV network, a TV station, a radio station where you're licensed by the government, you're getting a clear message about, don't tangle with Donald because he might use the powers of the presidency to complicate your license. And by the way, this is a subject I know deeply. I'm the only journalist in American history who got a broadcaster forced off the air, six stations, very profitable stations for news manipulations and lying. Um, the, the, the concern is that Donald is uh, stirring up and discrediting people who are doing honest journalism. Donald loves journalism that repeats his lies. What he can't stand is honest journalism. I don't think he's being successful in intimidating journalists. We're seeing pretty vigorous coverage of him. But he's certainly ending, uh, uh, giving aid and comfort to uh, dictators or near dictators like Erdogan in Turkey, uh, Putin in Russia, uh, Modi in India, Duterte in the Philippines, who are imprisoning and in some cases murdering journalists who are simply doing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Hey, David, you've started a new project called DCReport.org. It's a nonprofit news service that, in your words, reports on what the president and Congress do and not what they say. Why did you start the service? Well, right after Trump won the Electoral College, my best friends and I got to talking about what to do, and uh, we decided that we the press was unlikely to cover the substance of what Trump did. They were going to be continue to be fascinated by his crazy statements and tweets and behavior. And uh, frankly, we have not been particularly successful in raising money. I mean, we've raised, I don't know, in the last uh, 13 months, I think we've raised $140,000. And the writers we have who do stuff for us get $100 an article or in some cases nothing because we just haven't been successful in raising money. Well, I've watched other organizations, some of which are very good and some of which are not, you know, raise huge sums of money. But we fundamentally believe that you need to cover, it's our government, it's our constitution, and we need to look out for our government and our constitution. And frankly, nobody else has been focused just on what Trump is doing to our government. DCReport.org is a nonprofit. How important is the nonprofit model to the future of journalism? 
Well, unfortunately, it's become, going to become a more and more important model. You know, the press began 400 years ago providing news to people who were in commerce, to uh, traders and manufacturers who needed to know if the portmaster in a distant port was a crook or a war had broken out or uh, some, some change of government took place. And it was a way for the commercial classes that were emerging 400 years ago to insulate and protect themselves from the aristocrats who were predators to them. Uh, you start to be a successful business, they wanted to take your money. And what's happened in, in recent times is the internet has taken away that model. Um, uh, Google uh, is not a news source, but you'll hear people all the time say, I get my news from Google. Google doesn't have a newsroom. Google simply takes the news from places like the New York Times that spend enormous amounts of money. News gathering, to do it right, is a very expensive business. And they distribute it then for free, and they sell ads for Google. And so unless we come up with uh, more and, and better funded nonprofits, uh, we're not going to have a free and vibrant press. Uh, and I, this is something I'm deeply concerned about. I've been lecturing all over the world about it. I lectured this year alone on, on, on every continent except Antarctica about Trump and about these issues. Um, and we should be gravely concerned because we need to have a vibrant press and we need a press that is well funded in order to do its work. Otherwise, what we're going to get is cheap news. Mm -hmm. Which we're getting a lot of anyway right now. So perhaps this is a new I'm, I'm curious what sort of reaction you've had as, as you've gone around and, and, and talked around the world. Well, journalists in other parts of the world and ordinary people that I talked to in my when I did these basically two round the world trips uh, this fall, um, people outside the U.S. just are looking at our country and going, have you all gone mad? Uh, they're not having any trouble understanding that Donald Trump is unfit for office, that he's not mentally balanced. And but they look at our country and they go, why can't you fix this? And, and of course, we don't have a parliamentary system. So you can't just call a snap election and throw the prime minister out if he can't get a majority. Uh, we have a much more conservative and cautious system. Um, I did not meet anybody, and I tried um, in traveling around the country, who thought Donald Trump is terrific. I mean, I, I spoke to cops in South Africa and to um, uh, city hall officials in Tromso, Norway, above the Arctic Circle, and just some ordinary people I engaged in conversation in a bar in Paris and uh, students that I spoke to at Sydney University. And I, I didn't find anybody who went, God, thank goodness you have Donald Trump in your White House. Nobody anywhere seems to, to have that view. Well, that's not much of a surprise, I guess. Uh, I, I think what's more surprising is how many people do feel good about Donald Trump being the president in this country. That, I think, disturbs him well, more than I, anything else. And, and I think that the people in the U.S. who feel that way fall basically into two groups of people. One of them are the people among the 90 percent who I've been championing and writing about for the last 25 years and documenting how government policies that nobody knew about until I wrote about them in my books and in the New York Times when I was there are being predated, being economically savaged by Goldman Sachs and Wall Street and various uh, predators who Donald Trump said he was going to drain the swamp uh, of in Washington when, in fact, he stocked it with the biggest predators around. Uh, the second group are people who hate the civil rights movement. And we need to realize that there's a substantial minority of Americans, probably between a quarter and a third of Americans, who hate the civil rights movement. They don't want to sit next to a Latino on an airplane. They don't want to have an Asian in the cockpit. And God forbid they have to report to a black woman boss. Mm. And Donald Trump, they find someone who speaks for them, who says neo-Nazis include fine people. And you're never going to change those people. The only thing that's going to change is time and society moving forward. Like the poor, however, they will not always be among us. Mm. 
David K. Johnson, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He's been covering Donald Trump for nearly three decades, author of numerous books, including The Making of Donald J. Trump. His latest, It's Even Worse Than You Think, What the Trump Administration is Doing to America. David K. Johnson, thank you so much for your time with us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. We do look forward to having you back again with us soon. Thank you, Jim. Me too. You're quite welcome. And this is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for Stand Up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with Think Progress reporter Esther Lee. We welcome uh, to the program. Esther Lee covers immigration issues for uh, Think Progress, a good friend of the program. And um, what a day to get you back here, <laughs> Esther. What a week, because uh, that's all we're talking about almost. Um, uh, immigration certainly dominated the news uh, uh, with the uh, the shutdown talk uh, last weekend. And you are a dreamer. How long have you been part of the program? I have been part of the program for since 2013. Um, I applied in 2012, and I got my first DACA card in 2013. DACA, referring to the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. And it started in 2012, didn't it? That's correct. It, uh, the president, pre- former president, um, Barack Obama, he announced the program back in June 2012. And so... Um, how often do you have to renew? Every two years, and it costs a lot for many dreamers. It costs about four hundred and ninety-five dollars, and the program grants. Temporary- People don't realize that, and only it's a, it's only every. I mean, you have to renew every two years, and you have to pay. You have to pay every time you re- you renew, and every one hundred and twenty days, or sorry, one hundred twenty days before your card expires. You have to renew. So there's always that worry of this program being temporary, which it is, and it's intentional and it's temporary um, nature, right? Like this is a way for Congress to pass a permanent solution for these dreamers to find permanent work authorization for them to find permanent deportation relief. Right. So um, how did you get here into this country? Well, when I was two years old, I was brought to this country. Two years old. Mm -hmm. I was brought here uh, from Taiwan and my family was escaping a very bad situation. Okay. So you were at the age of two and I'm sure your parents sat you down and they said, okay, now we're going to the United States (laughs) and it's up to you. Do you want to come with us or not? I mean, certainly between the bottles and the naps I was taking, I totally had that conversation with my mom. <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of these dreamers have no choice in whether or not they want to come to another country, right? And that is something that people should keep in mind. They, uh, a lot of people were brought here with no fault of their own, but a lot of people did come here knowing that they were coming here, but not really understanding why they were coming to yeah, another country. Yeah, they might have been five or six, exactly. right? They knew they were going to another country, but still they didn't have any control or authority exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, over it. And um, in terms of, um, as part of your renewal, mm-hmm. you they fingerprint you? They fingerprint you. They take so much documentation from you. I remember my first application, you had to list um, all your residences from seven years before from where you had, from when you had applied. So I had addresses in like New York. I had addresses in, I believe, California. I, I'm forgetting because it's been so long. But they do take a lot of information from you and they do vet you thoroughly. What if you ever, uh, what if you committed a crime? Then you cannot apply. This is one of those things where people should understand that dreamers who have committed a crime cannot apply for the program. And there is a whole checklist that you have to check off. Are you a terrorist? Have you committed a crime? Are you in a gang? And you, if, as long as you say no, you know, you go through a system, they do a criminal background check on you. And if you're lucky, you, you get your, your DACA card. Uh, and how long do you have to be a dreamer before you become a citizen? Um, you cannot. Because there is no pathway to citizenship. And that's something that President Trump last night, he, in a very funny way, he said that uh, he would be open to the idea of dreamers morphing into citizens as though dreamers are some sort of Pokemon <laughs> fighting in a battle arena. Like, yeah. I don't know how that's possible. But uh, so 
it, it, a lot of people believe, I, I asked mm-hmm. that question, I mean, I know the answer, but a lot of people believe that dreamers uh, can any time just turn around and become citizens. There's no pathway <laughs> to citizenship as part of the dreamers program. That's correct. You could be a dreamer for the rest of your life. That's correct. And you would still not be an American citizen. That's correct. I know people in their late 30s who didn't qualify for the DACA program, people um, who are dreamers, and they did come as they when they were kids, but they do not qualify for the program. And no, okay. this is not a permanent program where it transitions right. into citizenship, yeah. just like the temporary protected status for all these Salvadorians and Haitians. Mm-hmm. Same same logic, you know. There is no transitional period. So when Donald Trump yesterday said and surprised a lot of people, and I think disappointed a lot of Republicans, or puzzled or angered, uh, saying he's open. To citizenship for the dreamers, um, one, do you believe him? And two, uh, if so, that would be good news for the dreamers. I right? think it's admirable for him to say that, but I also think that Stephen Miller wasn't next to him when he said that. Um, <laughs> as we know, Stephen Miller gets to dictate a lot of what happens with our immigration policy, uh, starting from when Trump was became elected, right, with the Muslim ban, with all of these TPS programs ending, you know, that wasn't just President Trump. That was also Stephen Miller. It was also some of his his advisors. Um, So I feel like that, as admirable as it was, it was more of an off-the-cuff comment from the president than it reflects reality. Uh, And a comment that could easily, as you say, be killed in the crib, if you will, by Stephen Miller, John Kelly, or Tom Cotton. Absolutely. And as we're going to see on Monday— Um, when the White House releases their immigration framework, we're not going to see these, quote unquote, bills of love, right, that President Trump has said in the past that he would want to pass. Um, But what we are going to see is an intentional cutting of the uh, immigration system, both on for undocumented immigrants and on legal immigration. Right. So uh, you said something I wasn't sure I knew. Monday is that is is we're supposed to they're supposed to unveil this bill on Monday. Um, I believe the press secretary said that yesterday or at some press conference earlier this week. She said that the White House is ready to release an immigration framework on Monday. Well, yeah, okay, <laughs> all right. I mean, Donald Trump has already supposedly done that because they, you know, when I go to the briefings, they, she, Sarah Sanders keeps pointing out there are four things, right? right? The four things we want: we want the wall. Otherwise known as border security, we want the so-called, they call it, chain migration. I'm going to ask you about that later. The visa thing, visa lottery, and the dreamers. I Mm -hmm. mean, that's their framework, those four things. But they're all very fuzzy. I mean, we don't know. It is very vague. And a lot of these things are are things that have brought actually a lot of um, Trump's advisors, their families, into the country in the past. So, um, meanwhile, we've got four members of Congress. Mm -hmm. In the House, Steny Hoyer, Kevin McCarthy. In the Senate, Bob, uh, John Cornyn and Dick Durbin, who are charged with crafting the bill that the Senate's going to vote on, in theory, before right. February 8. But, I, I, but we're, we're not close to seeing that bill or have any idea what it would look like, correct? No, we don't. But we do have some indication of what kinds of bills uh, Senators Durbin and and Hatch, you know, who you didn't mention, but like yeah. who and Graham, what yeah. they would support, right? Because in the past, they have supported federal legislation called the DREAM Act. And they've been supporting this bill since 2001. And it was essentially a bill that would provide a permanent pathway to citizenship for dreamers who are brought mm-hmm. to this country. Um, so if Durbin is involved in this bill, I have great faith in him uh, in having a friendly bill towards immigrants and having one that is inclusive of a lot of these dreamers um, who are currently, their lives are in limbo. Okay. Uh, The president did speak yesterday Mm -hmm. uh, about his thoughts on chain migration. Again, uh, kind of all over the place, but... uh, so uh, here, here, here's what he told reporters. Mm-hmm. Chain migration, we're going to uh, create a standard that's a good standard so that not everybody can, you know, not everybody that you ever met can come into the country. But you'll have uh, wives and husbands and you'll have sons and daughters. Wives and husbands and sons and daughters, maybe mothers and fathers. I don't know. He doesn't say. But so... Um, Let's talk about that. Chain, the term 
chain migration. It is a pejorative term by itself. Uh, and if you look on... What's a better term? Family migration? It would be family reunification. Family reunification. Um, and that's exactly what it is. It's yeah. a way for people to bring in their families, albeit in a very slow fashion, of um, allowing them to reunify with their families. How does it work? So... Uh, one person here in America, let's say a U.S. citizen, is able to sponsor for their family back in, let's say, Canada, Norway. Let's go with Norway. Norway. <laughs> let's go with Norway. Yeah, because we need uh, more white people from Norway. It's it's their way of being able to sponsor them. But if you look at and actually, how broad is it? Meaning, uh, how about my third cousin once removed? <laughs> I think that's a little hard to do because you. The, are there limits in on it now? There are limits in terms of how many generations out you can go and also how many cousins out you can go. But if we were to look, I have two points on this. Um, if we were to look at some of Trump's advisors, let's look at Dan Scavino. His great-grandfather, his grandfather who came here from Italy, was able to bring in his brother two years later after he came in, who was able to bring in another brother and another sister. And... When Trump, Do you think Donald Trump knows that? I don't know. That's a good question. We should ask him. I have a guess. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to guess it's a no. Mm -hmm. And even if it is a yes, I think that they don't care because it happened so many generations ago. So therefore, it's okay. But it's it goes to the hypocrisy of the issue. But for the people who do bring in their families, um, these are the people who are able to economically bring in their families. So it's not like their families are a burden on the American taxpayer system. And if you look at the research, there is a lot of there are a lot of studies out there. The people who bring in their families are able to hold more consistent jobs. They are able to make more money. And the people that they bring in are more well educated than uh, some of the other immigrants that come into this country. How long does it take to get a uh, to to get a app, to get your application approved? It really varies by country. So for certain countries like the Philippines, it takes ten years to sponsor your brother and sister. Mm. That's how long it takes. Mm -hmm. So it's not like uh, I see all these commercials that Numbers USA puts out of how you could bring 65 me family members. And it's like by the time you're able to do that, you're probably dead and you wouldn't be able to sponsor anybody by then um, because these processes take so long. And so I would you agree that there should be some limits? I think that there are already limits put in place. It's hard enough to sponsor one person due to cost, due to time, and due to how our immigration system is now. It is already hard enough to sponsor a relative. Mm -hmm. um, so what is this visa lottery all about? So the diversity visa, diversity visa okay. has always been, for I think about two decades now, has been a program that the government has used to, to select well-qualified and, and well-educated immigrants from countries that don't normally send immigrants to this country. And by that, I mean like a lot of African countries are able to come in. A lot of African immigrants are able to come in on a diversity visa because they otherwise wouldn't have any possibility of coming into the country based on the visas that we have here. Um, and the people who do qualify for diversity mm. visas, they don't always come in because they may not have the money to do so. But of the people who do come in on a diversity visa, you see that they've uh, helped grow the economy in many ways. Many people are tax drive, taxi drivers. Many of them work in hotels. You know, once they get here, they have jobs because they look for them and they actively work to become a part of American society. So uh, people, th these are not, th I, I think I had these in my own mind confused with the special status that mm -hmm. countries like Haiti or El Salvador right. might, might, but that's not, that's totally different. That, totally different. Um, the temporary protected status is what I think you're yeah. thinking of. Yes. That is a visa that's given to uh, people who are escaping war or violence, civil war. Countries in where there's real physical danger. Yeah. Or, you know, in Haiti, we had those two the earthquake. big earthquakes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are temporary statuses for people to come into this country and um, on 18-month extensions. Um, and. It allows them to work legally and allows them to contribute to this country legally. Right. So do you believe that we are any closer today uh, to immigration reform or to resolving even the Dreamers program uh, question than we were last Thursday? I'm laughing not because I'm, you know, this is a funny topic, but because I'm just so disappointed on so many fronts because Dems did cave. 
in many respects on um, a deal to help dreamers. But Republicans are also going to go hard on February 8th, which is 14 days from now, right? Like we're going to be in the same situation on February 8th as we were last last week. Uh, we're probably going to face another shutdown, maybe another day shutdown where we pass a short-term continuing resolution um, that, again, does not have any protections for DREAMers. And for every day that we don't pass immigration legislation, we will see DACA recipients lose their status. And yes, there is a court injunction right now that allows a lot of these DREAMers to reapply. But does not allow new dreamers. It does to not apply. allow new dreamers to apply. That's correct. But also, while these people wait for their statuses to be renewed, they are at risk of deportation. And we are already seeing that with these, you know, border agents who are taking in dreamers on Greyhound buses, border agents who just stop dreamers because they can, and interior checkpoints. You know, these are stories of real lives of real dreamers who need permanent protections. Uh, that, so that's already going on now. That's you mean while on. they're in this period of ha- of of renewing their application, they're subject to deportation. They if they if their statuses are not current, right? Then yes, they are out of status essentially. So I saw um, it was um, leader uh, Chuck Schumer or um, Whip uh, Dick Durbin yesterday say that. Um, we're better off. The dreamers are better off today, or, or, or those who support the dreamers program are better off today than they were last week. I, and I thought, how? Would you agree with agree with that? I would not necessarily agree with the senators. I mean, seriously, um, how are they better off? Right? They're still in a place where there's no permanent protections. Uh, they are still. Um, in limbo, so to speak. And for every day that passes, this is an average statistic that was made before the court injunction happened. But about 122 dreamers lose their status. And every day. From September when President right. Trump yeah. ended the program until now. Yes. Uh, so um, on this, now we're facing, of course, there's the February 8th, which is when the government runs out of money. Uh-huh. And... Um, a lot of people said, well, we didn't get this dreamers program fixed last week because we weren't at the deadline yet. And even by February 8th, we won't be at the deadline. And a lot of people in this Congress don't seem able to act unless they are within 24 hours of the absolute drop-dead legal deadline. So maybe they won't be willing to address this issue until March the 4th at about noon. But the president was asked yesterday about this deadline. And again, talking about a guy who is all over the place, uh, here's what he says. About, they ask him uh, whether you're going to stick to that uh, uh, March 15th deadline, or could you possibly extend it? I'm not guaranteeing it because I don't want to do. You know, I want to put a little bit of a right. But I certainly have the right to do that if I want. All right. So <laughs> he's he's suddenly saying, "Well, March 5th, March 6th, March 15th. I mean, you know, I could do anything I want." <laughs> he he set the deadline for March 5th. Five when he threw it to Congress, so I guess he could extend it, right? He could, but you know he could have not ended the program to begin with. <laughs> that would have been uh, great. Yeah, hello, yeah, but right. Th- these are arbitrary deadlines, and dreamers are not a homework assignment for Congress to leave until the last minute. And by the last minute, there is no last minute because every minute is the last minute for dreamers. Um, we're talking about eight hundred thousand lives here, who of people whose whose immigration information is already with the government. If you have rogue agents who are mean, they could probably go after these dreamers if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. Um, And this is not a negligible number of people who are affected, who are waiting as bargaining chips as part of Congress's delay. Um, You know, DACA recipients, they are they are resilient, but they can't continue to be resilient while their DACA status are, are expiring, right? And as they expire, they also have to do other things like tell their employers, hey, by the way, I have to quit soon. And so they have to like, you know, they have to tell their employers, they have to start getting ready for their life after DACA. Um, and it's it leaves them in a sort of uncertainty that well, we just shouldn't leave them in because they are part of America. No, that's the big problem that I see with so many, and I, I've, I've heard many speak about this, is the uncertainty you're going to college, right? You're you're working for your degree. Right. Um, you may get your degree, be on the track to get your degree 
this June, but you have no certainty that you're going to still be in this country in August, right? Absolutely. Uh, and if I may or just, before. just quickly talk about this kid I met down in New Mexico when my coworker, Victoria, and I went in December. He lives down in New Mexico, which means that he lives on the southern border. And within the board, within the southern border, there are interior checkpoints where border agents can question you for your immigration status. This kid, Brandon, his <laughs> DACA status expires in May, which means that once May comes, he can no longer pass through the interior checkpoint to other parts of America because he will be questioned, hey, are you a U.S. citizen? But and what if he reapplies? If he's able to reapply, then he could stay. But then, again, the uncertainty happens. Yeah. But, you know, I feel for people like Brandon, for the southern communities who have to deal with this because DACA is not permanent again. But also for Brandon, he has to quit his education. He's on his last semester of and he can no longer support his education and support himself. So he has to choose. Do I make money for all for the next four months um, to support myself so I could survive? Or do I make money so that I could continue my education? And this is also an issue of public safety, if you think about it. Because once the DACA um, expires, DACA recipients can no longer get driver's licenses, right? Because they're out of status in many of these states. They also can't get in-state tuition. That's another mm -hmm. issue. So they can't continue their education. Um, so there are a lot of ramifications to these arbitrary deadlines that Congress and the president sets. And while we're talking about um, dealing with, for the most part, the conversations so are about illegal immigration, I mean, what Tom Cotton and others really want to do is that they... they I've heard it said that they won't do anything about dreamers because their real goal is to cut legal immigration in half right. or substantially. So, uh, and they're using dreamers as a wedge to kind of get people to deal with that issue. Why don't we deal with the problems that we have here now, which are the dreamers? But if they really wanted to deal with legal immigration, you know, Tom Cotton and uh, – and uh, Bob Goodlatte, they both have separate bills. I think Secure America's Future is Bob Goodlatte's bill, which essentially is the same thing as Tom Cotton's, which is to cut immigration, punish sanctuary cities, cut asylum thresholds, um, and I think cut legal immigration by like 25 to 40 percent. Mm. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's not what America was founded on. That's not our values. Um, and there are a lot of problems with those goals that they have. Uh, for example, asylum is something that a lot of people apply for, and they are thoroughly vetted. But that's another story. Right, right. But you can. So, I mean, I think the strong argument is okay. Fine, deal with the dreamers. Just deal, deal with that as Senator Feinstein recommended mm -hmm. to the president, and then all these other issues. We'll talk about all those other issues, but not lump them all into the uh, into the same pot. So um, the debate continues, and you're right in the middle of it. Esther Lee from uh, Think Progress, ThinkProgress.org. Thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. Janelle Jones, David K. Johnston, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.